So we're going to have Howard come back up here again. And, and what's significant about the juxtaposition between Mark and Howard is that when Howard was born, there were horses and buggies <laughs> on the street. And in the kitchen, there was an icebox. And today, we have cars that park themselves and robots that are wandering around Mars. So Howard, it's great of you to come up here and give us a little talk about what you're up to. Thank you so much. You're quite right. My father had a Model T. <laughs> so, Karen. Well, good morning, all. It's a great pleasure to see you all. This is going to be possibly a, a trip down Melody Lane, memory lane, because most of you were too young to know what I'm talking about in 1920. Um, some of you might be, but you don't admit it. So um, my career has been really 74 years. I started as a dance band in 1917, 19, uh, well, I don't remember. But, uh, but then, then I, uh, the career started in, in CBC because um, Percy Faith left Canada for a, a greater contract in the, in the States. And uh, CBC didn't know how to replace him. So I had a, a friend, an announcer on CBC who was very, very devoted to big band music. And he loved... The, the, the big bands of the era, which is, of course, in the, in the 30s. And he had a record collector, and he, he and I got a good friendship. He, he saw me working with a band in Kitchener, and uh, he was impressed. So uh, he told the, 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 uh, the, 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 the headquarters in CBC to try this guy Cable. He's, he's, uh, he's 19, and, and he's, he's got talent. So... They called me in and gave me a band and had me write a, a program, an audition program. And they bought it. They engaged me. I, I succeeded Percy Faith. And I couldn't believe it. I was 21. And uh, they named the program Music by Cable because the, pre the previous show was M Music by Faith. So that's what happened, how it started. And um, I'm going to tell you that that um, the career has been many varied. It's, it's, I always conducted, I always wrote, I composed, and the whole 74 years I've done that, so that runs right through everything. But um, the career has been branches here, branches there. It's 50 years, 50, five, five decades from the 40s to the 80s. And I'll tell you about the 80s when I finish, uh, how that happened. But um, I, it's a capsule of, of five decades. So I'll just tell you how it all happened, because uh, I know you want to hear encouragement words from an old guy. But um, the old guy has always done two things. He has converted every negative into a positive. He's never let negatives in, interfere with his working and his, in his career. And positivity, adaptability, and versatility, they're, they're quite simple words. But my whole career has been that way. Uh, I've adapted. I, I keep getting uh, ideas. Somebody said, will you do this? And I've never done it before. And I say, why not? Why not? Accept uh, absolutely every idea that, that you think you can do, and then wrap it up. Research it, do it, and it's, it's, a, it's a given. That's my feeling. Anyway, we're well, starting with the 40s. Um, the 40s were completely different in radio. There was no television. 40s in radio were the, 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 the owner of... of uh, programs by sponsors, and uh, all the agencies, the ad agencies, were the responsible for getting the program. The CBC had the, 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 the technique, they had the wire, but they didn't control anything in the 40s. The same as in the States, Bob Hope was on for Pepsodent, 
Edgar Bergen was on for Jason Sanborn. So in, in, in Canada, the, the agencies representing the sponsors did everything. And uh, in the 40s, I was writing, I was, when I was, wasn't conducting, I was writing for other, other conductors. We did Goodyear, Goodyear Parade of Song. It was a series on CBC sponsored by Goodyear. It was uh, tip-top music for Canadians. Same thing. On CBC, sp the commercials were all tip-top. And then we had three, three symphonies. Uh, Sir Ernest McMillan was the conductor of the Toronto Symphony in the, those days. He, he was a very important man in music in, in Toronto and Canada. But the symphony was always on uh, as the, the no Northern Electric Symphony. This is the Northern Electric Symphony conducted by Sir Ernest McMillan. This is the Supertest Symphony. Supertest Gasoline sponsored a symphony program of Pops. And then there was the Simpson and Robert Simpson Company Pops. So it was all to do with, with identification of, of sponsors. And the agency would be the in-between person to decide whether the sponsor, the sponsors had ideas, but they didn't really know what they wanted. They, they had individual things. I don't like that, but I like that. You know, you can never please 100%. You, you try for 75, but they never get the other 25. But uh, that's what the, the, the agencies did. They, they rode herd on the sponsor. And the sponsor would say, I, I like this program, I, but there's too many, too many flutes, and not enough harp, and no more strings. And the agency will, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. And people, people addicted to madmen say, is, was that the way it was? Yeah, that was the way it was. I was working with agencies the whole time, 40s and 50s. And uh, the only difference between madmen and the truth is that there was no sexual overtone. <laughs> there were women there. And there were lots of women there. And, you know, it was a good thing because the guys kind of wandered a little bit. And the women would always bring them up to date. And uh, they'd have a, a, a three-hour lunch and come back, and they'd say, what are we doing today? And the, the girl would say, that, 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 that. So it was, I, I observed... Not the sexuality in the Mad Men, but the, the fact that women ran the thing. They really did. They ran the thing. And uh, it was a great, a great experience to, to work with agencies and, and do sponsorship uh, talking about the product. Because nowadays, they, they, all the, agents, uh, the, the sponsors buy in 20 second, 30 second. You know, they have nine commercials in a row. I don't know how that sells anything, but they, obviously they, they, it sells something. But in those days, we had Canadian General Electric. We did um, seven years with Canadian General Electric uh, with, a, with a, a beautiful orchestra on Sunday night, and it, we, we sold all the, the small appliances. The whole thing was based on the small appliance division of Canadian General Electric. Toasters, uh, steam irons, all that the small things, and um, th we're going back a little bit. That that was 1948. Let's go back to where I started in in 41, 42. Uh, um, I was given this music by cable, and that was created a bit of a stir. They said, you know, who's this guy? What what's he doing? And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the war was on, and I was. Rejected, I because of my eyesight, and uh, I was available. But uh, Robert Farnan, who was the great arranger conductor, who was in the Happy Gang, and he was the conductor and the music director of Jolly Miller Time on CBC. Now Jolly Miller Time was sponsored by Maple Leaf Milling, which is now Maple Leaf Foods. Um, but Maple Leaf Milling was was the, the Jolly Miller Time. And Bob Farnham was the director of that. So he, was, he would join the Army as, as, as head of the Army show with Wayne and Schuster. And uh, he suggested I take over the show. So that may put me in, in, in view of the agencies. The agencies knew who I was. And all of a sudden, uh, I was important 
because I was the new kid on the block. This was 1944 and 45. So, um, as I said, you have to be versatile. You have to take negatives into positives, and I did that all the way through. Um, in 1946, uh, Borden's decided to do a, a special talent show called Canadian Cavalcade, starring Lauren Green. That was before Bonanza. He hadn't gone to Ponderosa yet. But he was, in, he was the, the big staff announcer at CBC. So it was Can Canadian Cavalcade with Lauren Green, sponsored by Borden's with the in-between Young and Rubicam. The Young and Rubicam hired me, and we produced uh, two, two years of, of really quite, in the, in the 46, I thought it was a pretty, pretty damn good show. Um, we produced, uh, we introduced new talent. That was the, Borden's idea was to give new talent a chance on the network. So the CBC wasn't doing it. They were just, just a, a, a means to broadcast across the country, but it took the, the sponsors to do it. So Borden's wanted to sponsor new talent. So in 1946, in, in, as I remember, in October of 46, we introduced to the very first time on network television across the country a young pianist from Montreal, 21-year-old Oscar Peterson, his first broadcast. And uh, he was wonderful, as we all know what happened to Oscar Peterson, a world-class, world-class jazz pianist. Then the next month, we introduced another man from Montreal, 19-year-old Maynard Ferguson on trumpet. He didn't play the high notes in the, at, at, at then that he does now, or he didn't, but uh, Maynard Ferguson. That was the idea of Canadian Cavalcade. It was always to do, produce Canadian talent across the country. Then the next thing happened, um, as I said, you, you, adaptability is always, every, every orchestra was different. Every, every instrumentation was different. The sponsor wanted more violins or less harp, more flutes, and, uh, and you, you did that. Adaptability was very important. <coughs> the um, next thing that happened was General, Canadian General Electric, which I already referred to. <coughs> uh, Canadian General Electric wanted a, a, a nighttime Sunday night program, which was uh, the so-called good music, restful, Mantovani, Costellanitz type music for Sunday night, closing with a hymn at, the, 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 at, three, at 7.30 at night on Sunday night, we had to close with a hymn. So that, that program went on for seven years, five years on radio, and then two years. I'll come to that in a moment. But uh, Canadian General Electric was, was the sponsor. McLaren's was the agency. And uh, Leslie Bell Singers. Do you remember Leslie Bell Singers? Do anybody here remember Leslie Bell Singers? They were the they were the the the, the, the stars of the show with Charles Jordan as the uh, baritone soloist and Howard Cable and the orchestra. And that went on every Sunday night for 36 weeks for seven years. And we we had wonderful audiences. People phoned in, wrote back. You know, it was it was. It was one of those special shows. Again, there was nothing on television. Television hadn't started yet. That's coming up next. Uh, we had this wonderful show, and uh, it was running right into the 50s. Now, uh, the, my biggest challenge, and the, the adaptability is really in question in this one, because the Korean War started in 1950. And, uh, Department of National Defense in Ottawa, uh, Honorable Brooke Claxton was the Minister of National Defense. And he was very, very excited about having a radio show every week. He wanted a radio show to, the Army was not in good shape with the Korean War, and he wanted to boost the morale. He wanted to, to uh, certainly, to uh, get new, new soldiers in. And he wanted a, a real public relations show. And uh, it was to run for 26 weeks for two years, uh, sponsored by the Department of National Defense. Brooke Claxton was one of those hands-on 
um, sponsors. He didn't let the agency tell you what to do. He wrote the, the memo and said, I would like that. I don't like that singer, but I like that singer. And that's the way it worked. And that, again, it's, it's adaptability, always converting the, the negatives into positives. So interestingly enough, um, Brooke Claxton auditioned the, the uh, sent out a memo to all the bases. They had, there were 12 army bands at that point in, in the country, and he wanted every band to do one, one, one week, every Tuesday night, another band. And they all said, we can't do that. We, we, we were too busy playing parades and officers' mess, and it's too complicated. So Brooke Claxton called the agency, the agency that resembled the Department of National Defense, and there was um, uh, I can't remember the agency, but the, but the agency called Jack McLaren at McLaren says, what do you do about this? We need a band. We need a, a band for every week to pull in military music and pop music. And uh, what have you got there? All right. Well, so we have, I've, all of a sudden I am putting together a band. And I've never written for a band before. I've written for strings and harp and flutes and all of that. All of a sudden I have to write for military bands. My own military band, which is civilian band, and we went on the air, and that caused me to write a lot of music. I learned how to write for military bands in two months. And uh, it, it kind of worked, because the band was great. Wonderful musicians. The symphony, Toronto Symphony woodwinds, Toronto Symphony brass, and uh, there were no strings. It was just all military. So we had half military and half popular. And uh, we... we had a wonderful time with the band, and uh, after the war was over, the CBC decided to put the band on uh, Sunday nights uh, as a replacement for Wayne and Schuster. Wayne and Schuster uh, was a radio show at that point, and uh, they put the band on, and um, the band was heard across the CBC network and also in the States on Mutual, Mutual Network. And uh, the publishers in New York heard about it, and they, they started to tune in, and they, they were sure that that was the Eastman Wind Ensemble because the, the publishers in New York, you know, they don't know much about Canada. They thought that Rochester was right across the lake from Toronto, so it must be the Eastman Wind Ensemble from, from Rochester. No, it wasn't. It was the Cable Concert Band. And um, so I got a call from Chapel in New York to, to talk to them about publishing. So I went down to New York on the basis of the, of the band being on, and um, I was introduced to the president of Chapel. And he said, um, <clears throat> are you as good as they say you are? And that's, how do you answer that? I said, I hope so. I hope so. Max Dreyfus, he was the president. He was 92 years old, um, same age I am now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was the, the founder of Harm's music. He was the, the man who discovered Jerome Kern. He was the man who discovered George Gershwin. And he's talking to me about how I'm as good as I am. So I was very, very honored to be talking to Max Dreyfus. And he, he signed me up, and they published Newfoundland Rhapsody and, and, and my marchmanship and uh, the march from the, the uh, Korean War and several other things. So I got published in New York on the basis of that uh, broadcast. I didn't even look, look for it. It was all of a sudden that fell into my lap. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the same time, television is starting in, in Canada, 2000, 1952. And I, did the, I wrote the first show. Uh, I wrote the, the music for the first show, the popular part of the show. It was, it was September of 52. Glenn Gould was the, the soloist on the first television show. And we had two stations. We had Toronto and Montreal. And they, they flew the, the kinescope after Toronto. They flew it to Montreal. And uh, that was, that was a, a, a great start of, of television in, in Canada. And I was there when it started. Now, 
The next thing was, was the hockey night in Canada. And uh, that started with Foster Hewitt in November of 52. And Imperial Oil was the sponsor. And they, wanted, they, they ran the show. They wanted Happy Motoring to talk about the, the, the wonders of, of Imperial Oil. So they wanted a sports march. They wanted, because the Gillette Cavalcade of Sport was on in the uh, American Network, and they wanted something like that. So uh, McLaren Agency, my, my really home agency, was the one who had also had the, the account for Imperial Oil. So they asked me to, to write a march to open the, the hockey night. That march was called Saturday's Game, and it was on for three seasons until the beer companies came in and said, marches are corny, we want something other than that. So they, they scrapped the march, and uh, that was it. But the march was actually a rewrite of one of the marches I'd written for the Korean War, Voice of the Army, because I, I wrote, Brooke Claxton wanted uh, uh, every, every corps, every battalion, so saluted on Voice of the Army. So if they didn't have a, a regimental march, he said, write one. So I wrote six, six marches for the various things. And as it turns out, the uh, Saturday's game was a rewrite of the, of the, of the, the march for the dental corps. That was, the, that was the, a, a, one of the jokes that the musicians had, the, the dental corps. So that was the story of, of uh, how I... I managed to, to, would you like to say something? I would like to ask you, <laughs> I would like to ask you what is the secret to your memory? I mean, for me, yesterday is a blur. <laughs> and you remember the agencies and the name of the directors and the minutiae and how many episodes and it's all quite I'm stunning. I'm very fortunate. I think it has to do with genes and, and good luck, but uh, it's there. And uh, once, I, once I forget the past, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about some of the famous people that you worked with. You've mentioned a lot of the Canadians, but uh, in, in the little bit of reading I've done about your career, I noticed that you've worked with, with Ellington, you worked with Getz, you worked with Jack Benny, with Danny Kaye. What well, was Peggy Lee like? Peggy Lee was wonderful, because I was, I, I was coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was music director, uh, and this is 30, 40, 30 years after we talked about, uh, I was the music director of the Royal York Hotel, the Imperial Room. And the Imperial Room, in its heyday, had great stars. Ella Fitzgerald came every second year. Tony, came, Tony Bennett came every year. Peggy Lee came every third year. So it was, it was 15 years of, of, of musical joy. In the, in the Royal York Hotel. So that's how I, I remember all those, those great times. And of course, the, the, eventually the, the era finished. I've, I've closed more eras than I think about. <laughs> I mean, the era of the, of the cabaret disappeared. Right. You know, the, uh, the stars got too expensive or too sick. Ella, Ella stopped coming because she was ill. And uh, the audience were drifting away because they were getting older. We weren't, but they were. <laughs> and uh, they were drifting away, and they couldn't come out at night. And, and, you know, so the Royal York Imperial Room sort of spiraled down, and I left in 86. It closed in 87. Right. I was close. Dare I ask you, what do you think of hip hop? What do you think of rap? I, I once somebody asked me that, and I said it reminds me of feeding a, a rhyming dictionary into a corn popper. <laughs> All right, I think some of these people need a bio break, Howard. So, thank you so much for coming. By. Pleasure. Are you going to stick around for the rest of the? Oh day? yeah, we're doing Michael Van Hebel. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. So,